night also at the hotel. Uh, now I would like to introduce Paul Sputis. I'm delighted that he could come and talk to us today. Paul is a planetary geologist. I guess he's a, really one of the world's leading selenologists now. And he has a uh, great lunch uh, time uh, talk prepared for us. Thank you again, Paul, and thank you all for coming. Thank you much. I'm glad to be here to get, share with you a little bit of some of the really exciting stuff that we're finding out about the poles of the moon. Um, it's been a very interesting last few years. It, 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 it's been the best of times and the worst of times. It's the best of times in that a lot of people have gone back to the moon and found a lot of really interesting things. And it's been the worst of times in the sense that it seems to be receding from our grasp. But what I want to do today is to show you what we found and then you can evaluate in your own mind what its significance is. So I'll start off with my usual propaganda. I mentioned this last night in the round table. I think there's three principal reasons why the moon is important. It's close, it's interesting, and it's useful. The closeness aspect of it means that not only can we get to it routinely and easily, but we can actually control machines, robotic machines, in real time from the Earth. Now that's a unique attribute. It's a unique attribute for any other solar system object. Uh, in addition, there are always, there's always a launch window to the moon. No matter how you, you construct your architecture, you can figure out a way to both get to the moon and more importantly to get back from it, to get away from it if you need to. It's interesting in that the moon retains a record of the solar system and, and galactic history that is unavailable on any other planetary object. It tells us about both the history and evolution of the solar system, but also the history and evolution of the Earth-Moon system. There's an Earth record, a terrestrial record, of both impact and particle interaction that is recorded in the dust of the moon that can be recovered and read. But the most important reason the moon's important, I think, is because it's useful. It has the material and energy resources we need to create a permanent spacefaring infrastructure. And moreover, those material and energy resources are in forms that are easily accessible and easily usable once they're accessed. So what about the poles? Why are the poles of the moon interesting anyway? Well, in a nutshell, it's all because of the orientation of the spin axis, the obliquity of the moon. The spin axis of the moon is about inclined about a degree and a half from the plane of the ecliptic, uh, from a normal to the plane of the ecliptic, which means that fundamentally the sun is always on the horizon at the poles of the moon. Now, if the moon were a perfectly smooth ball, what they'd see in the course of one lunar rotation is the sun slightly above and then slightly below the horizon moving 360 degrees around you in a, in a big circle. However, the moon has lumps and bumps and holes. Now, if you're on a lump, you might stick up into the sunlight all the time, and if you're in a hole, you might never see the sun. And that simple relation has resulted in the creation of a microclimate on the moon, a microclimate in the lunar polar regions, where we have areas that are in near permanent sunlight in close proximity to areas that are in permanent darkness. Now these dark areas are quite interesting because they're extremely cold. There's only two sources of heat in a lunar polar cold trap. One is, that, one is the three Kelvin background of space, and the other is the heat flow coming from the interior of the moon, which until recently we really didn't have a good number for. The estimates before lunar reconnaissance orbiter were that the temperature in the cold traps were on the order of 60 to 70 Kelvin. We now know that they're much colder than that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Our first look at the sunlight conditions at the pole came from Clementine. Now, Clementine only orbited the moon for 71 days in 1994, so we only saw it in for part of one season. We arrived at southern, mid-southern winter and went up to the equinox at both poles. And these are two maps that show um, the lighting conditions of the poles. Let me get out my little laser pointer here. The uh, South Pole is in the condition of maximum darkness, so this was in midwinter. And fundamentally what you see is that it's, there's a great deal of black and purple on this, which is, which is areas of darkness. But even at maximum winter, we found areas here, 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 that are red and, and white. And that scale, by the way, which you can't read, reads from 70 to, to 80 percent illumination. That's over the course of one lunar day. So these are the worst possible conditions for daylight at the South and yet we still find areas that are in near permanent sunlight. At the north, we found areas that were in sunlight here along the rim of the crater Perry that were in sunlight for 100% of the lunar day. Now that was over the course of the, southern, of the northern summer and the southern winter. 
Now we have new data, and I'll first talk about the Kaguya data from this, the Japanese Kaguya mission. This magnificent high-definition TV picture shows the full Earth over the south pole of the moon. The point mark A is one of our lit areas on the Clementine map, A, B, and C. This is B, and this is C. And what you see from this image is, in fact, these points that we identified from the Clementine data are aligned along a topographic high. This is the rim of the crater Dagger Lash, uh, a massif here, and then the rim of Shackleton, all of which lie along an elongated mountain that's part of the rim of the South Pole Lake and Basin, the biggest impact crater in the solar system. So these three points collectively have 100% sunlight during the southern winter. So that, that, that collectively they have continuous illumination. The best one is point B right here, which has about 85% illumination in the middle of the winter. Now we also got from Kage, in addition to those great TV pictures, some very high precision, high resolution laser data. These are topographic maps of both poles, north on the left and south on the right. You see, first of all, the top topography of the north is quite bland, and that's because basically it's a rolling highland terrain, crater terrain, whereas the south pole has extremes of topography, ranging from huge mountains where you have 12 kilometers of relief over about 50 kilometers of linear distance. Huge, giant slopes. This is probably the biggest scarp I know of in the solar system. This prominence is called Leibniz Beta. It was a mountain that was actually mapped from telescopic uh, views back in the 30s. And it's, again, it makes up part of the rim of the SPA basin. So there are more topographic extremes in the south than in the north. So what we've done is to take this laser altimetry data and construct a topographic model and then illuminate it over the course of a seasonal cycle on the moon. And this movie is what this looks like. Now this crater that you see right in the middle is an artifact that's not a real crater, that's just the center of our axis of rotation. And what you see is as, 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 as the uh, daylight progresses from midsummer to midwinter, it gets increasingly dark. I can play that again if we want to see that, let's see. This is midsummer, so what you see is when that, fundamentally the area around Shackleton, this is point B, Point A is right here in the rim of the crater. Point C is on here. There's also a point D on this little topographic prominence near Shackleton. So what you see is that the extent of the darkness over the course of the lunar day gets larger as we approach midwinter. So what we do from these maps is to make illumination maps. And we've got three maps showing the conditions from summer, the equinox, and then midwinter on percent of illumination. And we do find several areas that are illuminated 100% of the time in the summer there's no area that's illuminated 100% of the time, I'm sorry, find areas that are near 100% illumination in the summer, but there is no area that's 100% illuminated anywhere at the South Pole or the North Pole. What we find are areas that are illuminated 100% in midsummer and then illuminated anywhere from 75 to 85% in midwinter. And these periods of, of non-illumination are discontinuous and irregular. They're dependent entirely on the local topography so they they're actually can be mapped out and planned for, and I, I contend survived, because the longest one is the duration of about 60 hours. Now in addition to this lighting data, we've also discovered information about the environment of the South Pole from Diviner, which is the infrared mapper on Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. These are some of the Diviner maps. These are residual temperatures found in both the north and the south. And the scale here, you can't read the numbers, but blues and, and purple on this scale is between 25 and 35, and that's degrees above absolute zero. So these things are not only extremely cold, they're about half the temperature that we thought they were from previous modeling. They are extremely cold. What's even more stunning is we find large areas here that are in, in light blue and green. Light blue and green is, is material that's less than 100 Kelvin. Now on the moon, anything colder than 104 Kelvin is stable, effectively, indefinitely, for geologic time. So what we found is large areas of the poles are extremely cold, and in fact, ice is stable at or very near the surface of the moon in these parts of the, of the polar areas. So where might volatiles come from uh, fr uh, that might be trapped at the poles? There's actually quite a, lot of, quite a few sources, and I'll show you some of, the neat, some of the new and interesting things we found, but fundamentally, the moon is bombarded by water-bearing objects. We heard this morning about the uh, properties of asteroids. Many asteroids contain water-bearing minerals. Comets are dominantly water ice. All that material hits the moon in a continuous rain. That material has to go somewhere. Now, the, up until now, we thought the vast bulk of it 
was lost to space through a variety of loss processes. And we still think that. We still think most of the water that hits the moon is in fact lost from the moon. But the fact is, a lot of it is retained. And the exact way it's retained and the way it's moved around and stored and sequestered is something that we really don't understand. We're just starting to get a feel for the fact that it's really a complex process. It's not a cut and dried thing of landing a comet on the moon and then sticking the ice in a coal trap. But primarily, most of the, most of the water comes from comets and asteroids and, and solar wind reduction. Effectively, if you have hydrogen that's implanted on the dust grains, uh, you have metal oxides in the soil, add a little heat, the hydrogen will reduce the metal oxides to native metal and hydroxyl. And that's a very common process. We do it in the lab on the Earth. Apparently, it happens naturally on the moon as a result of meteorite impact. Uh, there's a bunch of other exotic forms of possible water addition, including passage through the Earth's geotail, which may actually give some Earth terrestrial, some terrestrial atmospheric water uh, could be implanted in the moon as well. This slide I, I pinched from Paul Lucy kind of summarizes the processes that we think are going on. Effectively, all these sources are hitting the moon. Some of it's lost to space through a variety of processes, but in effect, water on the hot daylight moon is not stable. It's moving around. It's hopping around. It has a high thermal energy. It hops around by ballistic random walks, and basically it's moving from areas of high thermal state to areas of lower thermal state. So it wants to go to cooler areas, which is an interesting kind of, 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 of statistical tendency when you see some of the data I'm going to show in a minute, is it gets to the colder areas of the moon. If it gets into a cold trap, it's there. It ain't getting out because there's no process known to get it out. So when, as, as, as material is being deposited all over the moon, there are processes at work that concentrate the retained water at higher latitudes. That's the message of this slide. So what have we found lately? Well, the first big surprise came a couple years ago, actually, before these missions launched. And that's when some people started looking at some of the old Apollo material. Specifically, they analyzed this green glass. These are green glass spheres from the Apollo 15 landing site. They are pyroclastic uh, spherules about 40 microns in size, erupted from deep in the lunar interior, at least 400 kilometers below the surface of the moon, and shot into space in big streams of jets of magma called fire fountains. These things cooled in space, so that's why they assumed a spherical form. They're very primitive magmas. When they actually looked inside these glasses, up till now we had analyzed mostly the surfaces, but as they looked from the surface into the interior of the glass, they actually found water. And the water is present in quantities that suggest that the mantle contains anywhere from 250 to 700 parts per million water, which is astonishing because the previous estimate was well below one part per million. It was in the parts per billion range. So this is at least two orders of magnitude more indigenous water in the mantle of the moon than we had thought. The big surprise from the surface studies came from the moon mineralogy mapper instrument, which was on the Chandrayaan mission, the same spacecraft that I flew on. Uh, Carly Peters is the PI of that mission, uh, that, uh, that instrument, and uh, this is her data. I, I took this from her uh, paper in Science a year ago. Fundamentally, what this shows is the strength of the 2.8 micron absorption that Faith talked about earlier on the lunar surface, and it's in blue and purple here, and what you see is that the strength of that absorption gets larger as you go from the lower latitudes to the higher latitudes. The highest concentration of the adsorbed water, and what we're talking about here is both adsorbed water molecules and hydroxyl molecules on the surface of mineral grains, it increases with latitude. By the time you get to the poles, there's quite a bit of it. So effectively, this, is, this was quite stunning. I, no one really, people had, had been trying to identify the spectral feature for a long time. This is the first time that we saw how extensive it was. It's not only present in space, it's present in time. It's formed, it, it appears in, 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 um, uh, to, be, to be forming all the time, and yet it's moving because you see it in the colder areas in, late, in early morning and late afternoon images, and it's largely gone by the time you get to midday. So it's moving around on the moon. It's actually migrating from the hotter areas to the colder areas. Now, in addition to that, there was an instrument on Chandrayaan called the Moon Impact Probe, the MIP. The MIP was a little probe that was released. It had a camera and a mass spectrometer. This was released right after Chandrayaan re, uh, 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 arrived at the moon and basically deorbited and collided in the moon just a little bit north of the crater Shackleton. Effectively, it flew from a 100 kilometer orbit of Chandrayaan down to the surface. When they got to about uh, eight kilometers above the surface, about 82 degrees latitude, they saw this little spike right here of um, a species with an atomic mass of 18. And it turned out to be present in, at, in concentrations two orders of magnitude higher 
than the exospheric pressure at the, at, the, at the equator at about 10 to the minus 7 torr. And effectively, this is evidence. This is a water cloud, a water vapor cloud that the spacecraft passed through on its way to impacting the moon. And it, this is actually, I think, the water that's being created by the process, whatever process is creating the M3 water, this material is moving in motion from the, the lower latitudes to the higher latitudes. Of course, we've all heard about El Cross. It was in the news a lot last week. Uh, it slammed the Centaur upper stage into the floor of Cabeus, which is this feature right here. And effectively, it uh, uh, is, a, is a crater that's in near permanent shadow. It was picked largely because it showed a low uh, uh, flux of epithermal neutrons, which suggested that there was high hydrogen. But also, you could actually see the floor of this feature from the Earth through the telescope. And the idea was they wanted to see the plume created by El Cross from both the shepherding satellite and from the Earth-based telescopes. And I, to my knowledge, I don't think they saw anything with any Earth-based asset. I'm, I'm willing to be corrected on that if someone knows better. But we did get excellent data from the shepherding satellite. And effectively, they found not only water vapor released by the impact, but they also found water ice particles as well. In addition to a whole bunch of other, a real, a real uh, collection of, of bizarre species, including quite a lot of uh, uh, silver and, and mercury, of all things. Now, interestingly enough, it had been predicted about a decade ago that there might be a significant amount of mercury because it's a very volatile element. And if it was to reach the cold traps, it might concentrate there. The actual abundance of mercury in lunar rocks is quite small. It's at the part per billion level. But if you're grinding up the surface rocks over time, this stuff is migrating, you might have some of the volatile stuff end up in the, in the, in the uh, polar cold traps. In addition, they found a lot of species that look, quote, cometary, unquote. Things like uh, methane, things like ammonia, things like carbon dioxide, a lot of things, and, and simple organics. So there's quite a bit of material in these polar areas. It's not just water ice, it's a lot of the light elements that effectively we need to live and, and, and work productively on the moon. All right, now I'll segue into my stuff, the radar. Uh, imaging radar is, is been, they've been looking at the moon a long time with it. There's a, two difficulties with using radar, looking at the moon with the poles of the moon with radar from the Earth. One, you're only, you can't see all of the dark areas because you're always looking at it with grazing incidence. Because of the inclination of the moon's orbit, we can only look five degrees, five and a half degrees over the limb in both poles. So we're always looking at grazing incidence, and that's not where you get a good response in terms of detecting material differences in radar. The second problem is you can't see all of the dark areas. In fact, because of this grazing incidence, you can't even see the bottoms of some of the polar dark craters. So what we wanted to do was to fly an instrument that could look down into the dark areas from orbit in optimum viewing geometry to see what actually existed in these dark areas. Uh, before I'm sorry, I, before I go on, let me imaging radar works by uh, looking off nadir. So effectively, if you're in a polar orbit, you're looking off the ground track, you're imaging a strip that's parallel to the orbital ground track. Now, as the moon slowly rotates beneath the plane of your orbit, that means that on subsequent orbits, you map strips like this. Well, what's the net result of that? You end up with an excluded zone right around the pole, right where you really wanted to look. Now, we have a bunch of ways to, to get around that, but effectively, if you're in a perfectly polar orbit, because the moon's spin axis is inclined a degree and a half, you actually got a degree and a half wobble back and forth uh, over that area. So when you're at maximum elongation from pure polar orbit, you can actually uh, roll the spacecraft slightly and do what we call high incidence imaging. And that's how we got some, we, that's how we got coverage of Shackleton. It's also how we got coverage of some of the areas near Perry, which turned out to be extremely important. Now I want to talk about something called circular polarization ratio. Effectively, radar sends out polarization in one sense, but it receives polarization in two senses. And it does this because on typical planetary surfaces, if you transmit one polarization, let's say right circular polarized, you'll get a polarization inversion. So the way radio waves will hit right circular, they'll come back left circular. Now, on the other hand, if you get a double bounce, suppose I have an angle, a, a facet here, where I've got right circular coming in, it bounces once off one rock, it goes over here and bounces secondly over another rock, I can get some of the same sense back, like this cartoon shows right here. Effectively, you've got RCP coming down, it bounces off one surface, and it bounces off the second surface. You can get a, lot, a bit of the same sense back that you transmitted. That's one way to get high CPR. So CPR is not uniquely diagnostic of composition, it's also diagnostic of surface roughness on the scale of wavelength, the wavelength we're using. 
But another interesting thing about, about uh, CPR is that it's also, you get multiple scattering from ice. And the reason this happens is, is ice is transparent to RF. So the radio wave penetrates the ice, it's multiply scattered by inclusions and, and flaws in the ice, and you get a lot of the same sense back that you transmitted. This is called surface scattering, this is called volume scattering. The other thing that happens in ice is you get this effect called the COBE, the coherent backscatter opposition effect, which is the interferometric addition of multiply reflected waves to give you an enhanced signal. It's the brightening that you see. If you see in lunar surface photos taken at zero sun, you see a bright spot in the middle, right, at the zero phase point. We're doing the same thing, only we're doing it with radio wavelengths. Now, two other things about, I, about uh, radio, radio, radar, and ice. This is a plot from Steve Ostro's uh, paper several years ago. This is the total radar albedo, which is the same sense plus the opposite sense, versus the circular polarization ratio, which is the same sense over the opposite sense. This little symbol down in the bottom left corner is the moon, the bulk moon. It is, one, it's radar dark, and two, it has a low CPR. These other plots out here are Galilean satellites of Jupiter, like Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa, and the polar features of Mars and Mercury. They all have high CPR and high radar albedo. So with that in mind, let's look at some of the Minisar data and see what it told us. This was one of the first really good fresh craters that we looked at. This is a crater called Main L. It's 14 kilometers in diameter. This is the crater. You know that it's fresh because you don't see any other craters on top of it. It has a nice radial texture that you can see. And when you do the CPR map, you see high CPR associated with it. This is a characteristic of fresh craters. A fresh crater forms, it throws out lots of broken up rocks and blocks. Very rough, very angular surface. So you have high CPR, but you note you have high CPR both inside the crater and outside the crater. And this is exactly what you'd expect. The stuff ejecta thrown out has high angularity. The stuff that's inside the crater has high angularity. And in fact, that's shown by these two histograms where we've plotted the interior and exterior in blue and red, and you see that fundamentally those values correspond. Now, when we look at the craters near Perry, we see something a little bit different. First of all, we see a lot of craters. First of all, we see craters that are like Main L. This is the crater Whipple, which is about 18 kilometers across. But we see a lot of craters like this, small features that have high CPR inside them, but not high CPR outside them. And effectively, these craters are these features right here that are in permanent shadow. This is shown by the two histograms where you show the blue is the exterior of these craters. It's very low, very radar dark, and low CPR. And then you see this high material that's restricted inside the crater. And that was our first view that something strange was going on at the poles. Then we looked at it a little bit differently. We found other craters that were even more bizarre. This is a crater we call Rozhdevinsky N, which is a small crater on the floor of Rozhdevinsky near the North Pole. And what it shows, in addition to the high CPR, which you see in a lot of craters, inside but not outside the crater, we, says, we saw a very astonishing brightening in the same sense. And this is a characteristic of ice type returns, is when you see a very strong same sense response. Typically, that's exactly what you get from, from ice. And when we looked at Rozhdevinsky in, in greater detail, it started to get even better. This is the Chandrayaan image, the Minisar version. We also have an instrument on LRO that basically has a factor of five higher resolution. These are the, the S-band zoom images. And in detail, here's the same sense image of Rozhdevinsky N, and here's the CPR image. This is also looking at it from two different illumination directions. So in fact, we've removed any artifact caused by the radar illumination. And finally, the last variable to remove is any artifact caused by wavelength. So we have two frequencies on Minisar. This is S-band zoom, the same sense, and the CPR image. And this is X-band zoom, which is, this is 12.6 centimeters, this is 4.8 centimeters. So two different wavelengths. Both of them show the high CPR restricted to the interior and not on the outside. Now, how many of these craters are there? Well, we first mapped them at, at both poles. We didn't find that many at the south. This is a little bit surprising to me. We found a few, and I could map them out, and I've circled them on this in green. Things that are circled in red are just typical fresh craters, the same kind as Main L, the first one we saw. When you map them at the North Pole, you see a lot more. We found 42 of these things that are bigger than eight kilometers at the North Pole, all of them occurring, most of them clustering around the pole, but a few occurring quite at low latitudes, which is quite surprising. But remember, we were surprised because the extent of the less than 100 Kelvin thermocline, thermo uh, contour is, extends over quite a low latitude. So these things all tend to occur within that zone. When I compared that map of the CPR to some of the neutron models that were done from L Lunar Prospector, this is a model that's basically a, what's called a Pixon model, which, which 
it takes the low resolution neutron signal and it says, if I have this distribution of ice in permanent shadow, what might it look like to reproduce the low resolution signal? So it's a way of envisioning seeing through a low res smeared out signal. And this you get a map that looks like this, where you have a lot of different individual deposits. What struck me as I compared this map to that map was that it was almost a one-to-one -one correspondence. The areas where he shows on his Pixon map that he's getting this response, I'm seeing it on the CPR data as well. So on that basis, assuming that we've identified ice here and that we're not looking at some other bizarre kind of deposit, I did a rough calculation Some because people were asking me, well, how much is there? Now, to get volume scattering from radar, you need at least 10 wavelengths. More like 20 to 30 wavelengths is more appropriate. And we have 12.6 centimeter radar. So we're talking about ice and ice thickness on the order of 2 to 3 meters. And if you take that on these 42 craters and do the calculation, it comes out to be about 600 billion cubic meters. Now, I've, if you take that, take one step further and say, okay, this is all solid ice, which I don't necessarily think that it is. It might be a very fluffy aggregate. There's some evidence from the plume dynamics from Elcross that the stuff around the poles are very fluffy. It's not hard, indurated stuff. It's very loose and, and particulate. I can't see from the radar the difference between snow and the difference between solid block ice. I think that it's not solid block ice for the following reason. If there were, the meteorite bombardment would throw up ballistic fragments of that ice and it would land it on the cold uh, surface outside these craters and I would see an enhanced CPR signal around those. The signal I'm seeing around those craters is extremely low. So, what, so that suggests that it's very fine grain, very poor block material. And by the way, if you want to know how much is this, uh, I just did a quick calculation. The shuttle ET holds 735 metric tons, the water equivalent, hydrogen and oxygen. So you could launch a shuttle equivalent from the surface of the moon every day for 2,300 years, which is a nice little factoid. Uh, this, these are, so to give you an idea what the high-res data look like, these are our complete images of uh, high-res CPR maps of the north and the south. I've just taken this one area. This is actually the first image we got back from the LRO uh, North Polar data at a high incidence. And I was really struck by these, this is a same since image, and I was really struck by these craters right here. These are very small. These are on the order of about a kilometer, kilometer and a half. And it looks like they're, they're filled with this high reflective ice-like material. And it's interesting that you don't see this in all the craters. You'll see other craters around here that don't show this, that don't show this signal. So why is it in some craters and why is it not in all of them? I don't know. So where are we? Well, I think we now know that there are five different flavors of lunar water. There's the water that comes from the lunar interior, which was a complete surprise to almost everybody. We didn't really know about that. And that may have erupted, and we know that it came out of the moon 3.3 billion years ago. The question is, has it gotten out since then? And there are a lot of very fresh, unusual features, things like the Ena, the D caldera, that look that suggest recent volatile release on the moon. It may well be the moon is still outgassing some of this material. There are water and hydroxyl molecules present at latitudes greater than 65 degrees. That's what M cube found, and that stuff is in motion, and it's in motion toward the poles, toward the cooler areas. There's exospheric water that we see that's present occasionally at both poles. Now we don't, apparently this was a transient event because the ultraviolet instrument on LRO did not see, it does not see a water vapor cloud. What that suggests to me is that, in fact, this is episodic and sporadic, it's not continuous. There is water ice admixed into the regolith and this is present as a minor component and that's the L-cross results. L-cross found between five and 10 weight percent water I suspect, since Elcross is nothing atypical, uh, the Elcross target site is not atypical, it's very common throughout that area. So in fact, there could be quite a bit of water throughout that whole region. And then finally, I think we found pure ice that occurs in these craters, and it's present in quantities that are significant. I'm almost done. So what do we know now about the poles? Well, we know that the environment is, is unique. It has areas of quasi-permanent sunlight. It has areas of extensive water and other volatiles. It's an extremely useful place. But what we don't know is even more extensive. We don't know exactly how this terrain varies locally on scales of tens to hundreds of meters. We don't know, in some of the areas that look like they're permanently dark, if a mass 10 meters would stick up, would they, would they actually get sunlight? I think in a lot of those areas they would because some of the relief is actually quite low in, in the, on the tops of some of these mesas. 
And also, we don't know what the physical nature of the material is. How is it distributed laterally and vertically? The only way we're going to get this information is to land a rover on the surface of the moon and go into these areas and explore them and make in-situ analyses. Uh, I'll close with one thing. I've got a paper that I'm writing. Tony Lavoie from Marshall and I are writing a paper that basically set, tried to look at this afresh, taking the new data and saying, all right, if we have this material at the poles of the moon, can you go back to the moon on an affordable basis? Our answer is yes. And, and in fact, it's, it's, the approach is to use small steps where you basically, rather than, than establishing a huge, building a big heavy lift rocket and building a big spacecraft, you use existing robotic assets or adapted robotic assets and build up a robotic presence on the moon that starts using resources immediately and does that over time. So by using a small incremental steps, you can build up quite a bit of capability with time and then effectively create a turnkey outpost that people can move into when they get there. Uh, this paper, which we're writing, actually I'm going to submit, give this to, uh, to Lee to publish in the proceedings of this meeting. I've made uh, a, a couple of products for that. This is from the paper. This is what I call an ISRU map of, this, of the North Pole. And what I've done is I've mapped out all of our anomalous craters and their proximity to areas of lighting. So this is the, uh, the, the radar image. This is the uh, lighting map, and this is a Clementine-based map showing the North Pole. And you see these are actually in fairly close proximity. Uh, I don't want to have to try, drive 10 kilometers to take my feedstock to my processor, but I find a lot of these lit areas are actually close to possible sources of, uh, of ice. I'll just skip that one. So let me summarize by saying that, that effectively I think the moon has now shown us a new face. What it has shown us is not only is it possible to live there, it's possible to use what it offers to create a sustainable spacefaring infrastructure. That was the object of the vision for space exploration. That was the object that NASA never really understood, but in fact some people did. There were people at NASA working toward that end. And, in actu and I think now we know more than ever that the moon is the next logical place to go because we found that it can support what we need and it has it in, a in, in sufficient quantities to do that. So I think the moon is the logical stepping stone. It's the obvious next target. It's the place that gives us the most capability with the least amount of time. And it's a place where we can learn the skills we need to become a spacefaring people. Thank you. Uh, Lee, do we have time for questions? Okay. I'll hang around here if anybody wants to come up and ask me one or two. Tonight, also at the hotel. Uh, now I would like to.